Are we ready to go? Okay. We are live and ready. Let's go on the record, please. Good evening. I would like to welcome everyone to this remote public comment hearing in the Energy Facility Siting Board Docket EFSB 22-04, DPU 22-67, 22-68. This case involves the petition of Mayflower Wind Energy LLC, referred to as Mayflower Wind or the company, to construct a project that would connect a proposed offshore wind generation resource to the regional electricity transmission grid at Brayton Point in Somerset, Massachusetts. The company refers to this as the Mayflower Wind South Coast Project. I will describe the project in detail in a minute. My name is Robert Shea. I am the presiding officer in this proceeding and I am conducting the remote public comment hearing tonight. As you can see on your Zoom video stream, there are other people with me from the siting board who will be involved in the review of this project. I'll ask them to raise their hands as I uh, mention their name. First, there's Andrew Green, who is the director of the siting division. Next, Joan Foster Evans, the general counsel of the siting division. And Wayne Wong, the assistant director of the siting division. Council and company representatives from Mayflower Wind are also participating remotely on this Zoom public comment hearing. Using Zoom, the public will have a full opportunity to see and hear everything said during this hearing and to offer comments and to ask questions. For those of you accessing the meeting by phone dial-in, you too can hear everything and have an opportunity to comment or ask questions. The instructions on how to participate were provided in the public comment hearing notice that was published in the newspapers and in the notices sent to addresses near the project. The public comment hearing notice was also posted to the Mayflower Wind website. In addition, all of the information contained in the notice, including instructions for participation, is available on the website for the siting board under EFSB siting calendar and today's date. Furthermore, the entire petition is available on the siting board's website under the name Mayflower Wind South Coast. Please note that this public comment hearing is being recorded and will be published to YouTube. I will now briefly relate the nature of the filings made by Mayflower Wind related to its proposed project and the legal standards that govern the siting board's project review. Next, I will allow the company to make a presentation regarding the project. After that presentation, I will open the floor to comments and questions from members of the public who wish to offer oral comments tonight. Please note that we also will review any written comments submitted by the public by email through Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. Let me describe the project. The company would construct approximately 2.1 miles of high voltage direct current electric transmission lines that would be laid in Massachusetts waters. For the company's preferred route, the transmission lines would make landfall, landfall excuse me, on the western side of the Brayton Point Peninsula from the Lee River. From the landfall, the lines would proceed approximately 0.6 miles to a new high voltage direct current converter station next to an existing national grid substation, also on the Brayton Point Peninsula. At the, converter substa at the converter station, the high voltage direct current would be converted to high voltage alternating current. From the converter station, a high voltage alternating current underground transmission line would proceed approximately 0.2 miles to the point of interconnection with the electric transmission grid at the National Grid substation also located in Brayton Point. The company's project includes an alternative offshore route. The alternative offshore route, like the preferred route, would proceed through Mount Hope Bay, 
but the alternative offshore route would make landfall on the eastern side of the Brayton Point Peninsula from the Taunton River. The company proposes a design variation which could be applied to both the preferred and the alternative offshore routes. The noticed variation would involve expanding trenching and underground infrastructure for high voltage direct current cables. As a result of the expansion, the noticed variation would add infrastructure that would house additional conducts at condu conduits, excuse me, at the landfall and onshore. The additional condu conduits could accommodate the delivery of another 1,200 megawatts in addition to what the project would accommodate. The notice variation would provide an advantage for the future connection of offshore wind energy. Please see the notice for a full description of the proposed project. The offshore wind farm would be located in federal waters. Therefore, the siting board does not have jurisdiction over the wind farm or over that part of the electric transmission lines that would lie in federal waters. Mayflower Wind has filed three petitions, one with the Massachusetts Energy Facility Siting Board and two with the Department of Public Utilities. Three petitions have been consolidated for review by the siting board. The siting board petition was filed under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 164, Section 69J. Under this statute, the siting board will review the company's filing to determine whether the proposed project would provide a reliable energy supply for the Commonwealth with a minimum impact on the environment at the lowest possible cost. Mayflower Wind also filed a petition under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 164, Section 72. Under Section 72, the siting board will determine whether the project is necessary, serves the public convenience, and is consistent with the public interest. Finally, Mayflower Wind seeks approval under General Laws Chapter 40A, Section 3 for certain individual zoning exemptions and a comprehensive exemption for the project from the Somerset Zoning Bylaw. Under Chapter 40A, Section 3, the Siting Board will determine whether the requested zoning exemptions are required for the project and whether the present or proposed use of the land or structures is reasonably necessary for the public convenience and welfare. There are multiple ways that, a pub, that the public can participate in the Siting Board's review of the project. First is to provide oral comments at the remote public comment, comment hearing tonight. As I stated before, you may also file written comments. In addition, you may choose to seek participation as an intervener or limited participant. The deadline for requesting participation as an intervener or as a limited participant is Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. This date is also the deadline to provide written comments as outlined in the notice of the public comment hearing. We would encourage anyone who does seek to participate to review the material published on the Siting Board website, which outline the different ways in which you can participate in our proceedings. For example, you may participate as a full intervener. A full intervener has the right to ask discovery questions of the company, to present witnesses, to ask questions of witnesses testifying at the hearings, to file briefs and motions, and to appeal the decision of the Siting Board. In the alternative, you may participate as a limited participant. A limited participant can receive filings made in this proceeding and may file briefs with the siting board. The information on participation is also in the public hearing notice for this proceeding. <coughs> if you would like a copy of the notice and intervention rules, please send your contact information to me at my email, robert.j, as in James, dot shea, S-H-E-A, at mass.gov. And I can send the information to you by email. May I have appearances of counsel, please? Yes, my name is Eric Runge, 
And I am with the law firm of Dave Pitney LLP, and I'm counsel for Mayflower Wind. Thank you, Mr. Runge. Is there any other counsel for Mayflower Wind who wants to enter an appearance now? Hearing none. Um, thank you. I would note that the company has provided a certification that the notice for this public comment hearing has been provided consistent with the terms required by the siting board. Now, would the company like to begin its presentation regarding the proposed project? After that presentation, we will open the floor for comments and questions from the public. Yes, thank you, Mr. Shea. Well, please go ahead, make, make the presentation. Hello, everyone. My name is Kathleen Freeman. I am the state permitting manager for Mayflower Wind. I am joined in the room with several Mayflower Wind team members to hear your comments and to assist with answering questions. Our siting and permitting counsel, Eric Grunge, who just introduced himself, will speak about how this project meets the siting board's needs standard and our community liaison officer, Kelsey Perry, will tell you about our proactive community outreach and stakeholder engagement. Um, first, I'd like to start by thanking the um, siting board for giving us this virtual hearing opportunity to tell the board and a broader public audience about our project and thank you all of the attendees for your time and participation today. Um, next, you can go to the next one. Mayflower Wind is a 50-50 joint venture between Shell New Energies and Ocean Winds. Uh, Ocean Winds itself a joint venture between EDP Renewables and Angie. As such, Mayflower is backed by the combined capability and decades of broad, deep experience leading offshore and onshore energy projects across the globe with a strong focus on North America. Mayflower Wind is a standalone company with its own board of directors. Mayflower is based in Massachusetts with an office in downtown Boston and one on the South Coast in Fall River. Next slide. I'm gonna turn this slide over to our council to tell you about how this project meets the stand, the project needs standard. All right, and thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Kathleen, and uh, thank you for all who are attending tonight. We appreciate it. And so on project need, just a few things I wanted to say. And first of all, the, uh, the need for the project itself is driven by strong public policy requirements in Massachusetts and other states in New England. And by that, I mean by legislation, by regulations and executive orders that uh, require reduction in greenhouse gas emissions and require an increase in renewable clean energy supply and particularly from offshore wind and that uh, require the development uh, of the offshore wind industry it's, itself. And so we've had um, statute after statute that has been passed doing this uh, over the past almost uh, 15 years now. And so the most recent one was this summer. It was passed uh, in August of 2022 and, and signed into law. And it is the act driving clean energy and offshore wind. And part of that is to establish the procurement of 5,600 megawatts of offshore wind for Massachusetts by 2027. And Mayflower's project represents just a portion of that, of course. Uh, 2,400 megawatts is the estimated amount of the offshore wind generation facility. And so you can see that um, these policies drive this need for offshore wind, for reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, development of the offshore wind industry for the benefit of the Commonwealth and the region. Uh, the project is also needed to simply connect the offshore wind generation itself. It's out in federal waters. There's no transmission system out there. And so the project uh, before you is a connector transmission project to actually deliver the energy from that offshore wind generation uh, to consumers ultimately uh, to the regional system on land at Brayton Point in this case. And so um, that is part of the standard is is the project necessary to connect the generator? Yes, it is. And the other part of the standard the siting board uses is, um, is the generation likely to be available to contribute to the regional energy supply? And, and the answer to that is yes, it is. There are many 
um, indicators of commitment of the company to develop that generation, including power purchase agreements, contracts uh, for 1,200 megawatts already in place. And so the third reason for the need is the need to um, have this project to deliver the benefits of this project, environmental benefits, economic benefits, and energy system reliability and energy security benefits. And it brings all of that. So with that, I'll turn it back to you, Kathleen. Thank you, Eric. Next slide. The project is among the largest contributors towards meeting the Commonwealth's net zero emissions goals. The project will eliminate over 2 million metric tons of greenhouse gas emissions annually, equivalent to reducing the greenhouse gas emissions of more than 5 million miles driven per year. The project will bring new job opportunities and help ratepayers save $2 billion, over $2 billion over the life of the project, cost savings that help reduce the energy burden of low income ratepayers. Next slide. Our investment of over 115 million in initiatives is based on commitments made under Massachusetts Offshore Wind Procurement Awards, as mentioned by Eric. Um, 40 million towards offshore wind education, training, and workforce development, 8.5 million towards low income ratepayer support, 8.9 million towards diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and 10 million towards supply chain opportunities. Mayflower Wind will contribute to supply chain growth throughout all project phases and has committed at least 75% of all operations and maintenance jobs to be local. <coughs> Less than two weeks ago, Mayflower Wind signed an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding, with North America's Building Trades Unions and the United Brotherhood of Carpenters regarding the offshore and onshore construction work for the South Coast project. This partnership will help the next generation of highly skilled, unionized offshore wind workers. All of these commitments help Massachusetts meet its environmental and economic development goals and ensure that the opportunities that come from the project flow to the benefit of the local communities. Next slide, Leahy, thanks. Mayflower is in the process of permitting the development of a large scale offshore wind energy generation resource, resource as you heard um, the hearing officer say. It's capable of generating an estimated 2,400 megawatts of renewable energy um, from federal waters on the outer continental shelf in a single lease area under the jurisdiction of the Federal Bureau of Ocean Energy Management or BOEM. This slide provides a general overview of the lease area. Interconnection points must be robust for these large injections of renewable energy. There are two separate Mayflower wind projects for state siting and environmental review purposes. And they are the two separate connector facilities, not the single wind generation project undergoing federal review by Underbohm. And um, why you may ask, um, Mayflower intends to maximize output from the offshore lease area, which will result in more than one project delivering power to shore. Each project must be reviewed through the electric grid operator, ISO New England's interconnection process. ISO New England has a planning and reliability requirement that in effect limits capacity of a single project at a single point of interconnection to no more than 1200 megawatts. As a result, developing the full potential of the lease area will require multiple sets of transmission interconnection facilities. Mayflower has invested considerable effort and funds in maturing studies, regulatory process, and development for points of interconnection in Falmouth and Brayton Point. Both continue to move forward. Next slide, please. Brayton Point offers significant multiple positive attributes for interconnection. For starters, existing 345 kV transmission infrastructure will allow for a robust interconnection to the regional transmission system. 
uh, the beneficial clean energy reuse of a former coal-fired station site that historically had negative impacts on nearby environmental justice populations. Then there's the lack of direct abutters to this privately owned, previously disturbed industrial property. And then Mayflower Wind's mature position in the queue for interconnection, enabling the project to move forward in a quicker and more cost-efficient manner. Next slide. Thanks. This diagram shows Mayflower Wind's project components and what elements will be cited in each jurisdiction, federal and state. The South Coast project includes everything from the wind turbines in federal waters all the way to the point of interconnection with the regional transmission system at Brayton Point. Within Mayflower's federal lease area, the turbines will be connected to an offshore converter station that collects the power and converts it from alternating current to high voltage direct current for long distance transmission to shore. The HVDC cables are called export cables, and we plan to connect the power to the transmission grid via route up the Sakonet River underneath approximately two miles of Portsmouth on land and back offshore into Mount Hope Bay. The cables will make landfall at Brayton Point where Mayflower's onshore electrical converter station will convert the power from high voltage direct current to high voltage alternating current for interconnection at the National Grid substation at Brayton Point. The federal agency, BOEM, reviews the entire project in detail. Mayflower Wind's HVDC export cable system Route, routes through Rhode Island and Massachusetts are reviewed by the siting boards of Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Next slide. The offshore export cables are 90, about 90 miles in federal waters, 20 miles in Rhode Island state waters, and only two miles in Massachusetts state waters. The, uh, in Massachusetts, there are no cable crossings anticipated. The, um, within the offshore corridor, the cables themselves will be quite small with a bundled width of just over one foot. Industry best practices that fluidize a narrow strip of seabed within that cable corridor of about 2000 foot width lay the cable and allow sediment to fall back in place to bury the cable. The route was chosen after a careful study of many alternatives. Next slide. This slide shows the existing national grid substation previously used by the New England's largest coal-fired station, a portion of which will be repurposed by Mayflower Winds point of interconnection. Next slide. Underground export cables will routing uh, will be within existing previously disturbed privately owned industrial land within existing access roadways. There will be no infrastructure structure installed in town roadways, all in privately access roads on privately owned land. And Mayflower is proposing to lease and use about 10 acres of this larger 300 acre site. The converter station footprint will be approximately seven to eight acres. We've been working with the landowner as a tenant to maximize the future redevelopment potential of this private site. Next. This slide shows the, in more detail the onshore transmission route, which will connect the preferred Lee River landfall site to Mayflower Winds converter station and will be installed within existing access roadways, as mentioned, again, all on privately owned land. And the photo in on the slide just shows the foreground of where we propose to construct our converter station. Next slide. 
As Mr. Shea, uh, the hearing officer mentioned, Mayflower is also proposing a design variation to the project intended to minimize impacts to the community and the environment while providing flexibility for future expansion of the electric system to accommodate additional renewable energy generation. The noticed variation depicted here includes the preferred alternative plus the incremental facilities at landfall and onshore to accommodate additional renewable energy generation. Developing in this way is more efficient, avoiding a second construction disruption to the community when a second connector product project might be needed in the future. To the extent that Mayflower Wind seeks to use these additional, this additional infrastructure for additional HVDC export cables, Mayflower Wind would of course return to the siding board for approval to do so. And you can see in this schematic that there are hollow conduits that could be filled in the future with um, high voltage direct current um, circuits or cables. Next, next slide. Thanks. This project shows our schedule. I, based on this overall schedule, uh, you can see that we're in the middle of the permitting process with onshore construction expected to begin in 2024 once major permits are in hand. The schedule reflects all the construction combined, not just the portion in Massachusetts, for example, the horizontal directional drilling activities are expected to take one to two months. Once construction is done, all cables will be below seabed or underground. Next, Next slide. Mayflower is in the process of permitting the development of a large scale offshore wind energy generation resource as you heard, capable of generating an estimated 2,400 megawatts of renewable energy from federal waters on the outer continental shelf in a single lease area under the jurisdiction of BOEM. Mayflower submitted its construction and operation plan to BOEM. The COP covers the full lease area as well as the two offshore export cable corridors and the two corresponding onshore project areas, the connector projects. This shows us stepping through, we will be stepping through a robust environmental and public engagement review process. Across our lease area development, we will be looking at about 50, 60 permits with 30 agencies, federal, state and local. BOEM will look at everything from the wind turbine generators to the points of interconnection. And we are expecting BOEM to issue our draft environmental impact statement in the first quarter of 2023. Next slide. This slide, the state and local permitting underscores what I just said about the agency engagement. A lot of what's happening in Massachusetts is happening in parallel in Rhode Island. Uh, we filed our Massachusetts EFSB petitions in May, as uh, well as filing our Rhode Island EFSB application that same month. Uh, we filed our MEFA environmental notification form in August. For Massachusetts, we have engaged um, these agencies uh, informally for the past year or so, and we're planning on filing our joint application for a Chapter 91 license and water quality certification in the second quarter of 2023. All environmental and fisheries issues are being reviewed by state regulators who are closer to the local concerns. And in parallel, uh, these reviews are being undertaken in parallel with the federal review process. Next slide. Mayflower is building the project on a private site and does not foresee significant impacts to the community, such as congestion on local roadways. Despite the low impacts, Mayflower Wind will undertake several impact minimization and mitigation measures. We will work closely with and coordinate with the town of Somerset to establish construction schedule, hours, and logistics. We'll maintain a construction schedule website to alert abutters, residents, and other stakeholders of construction locations, 
dates, activities, and traffic control measures. We will coordinate with the town on um, traffic management plans, um, as well as the landowner and the tenants on this 300 acre site. And I can't stress enough that we are leasing a small portion, 10 acres of the larger 300 acre site. Um, we will use best management practices and ongoing environmental monitoring throughout construction to minimize noise, vehicle emissions, and other impacts at the site. Next slide. All offshore export cables will come ashore via horizontal directional drilling, or HDD. Use of high voltage direct current cables reduces the number and size of the HDDs. Essentially, it reduces the footprint of the project. And as mentioned previously, we are proposing two HVDC power cables and associated communication cabling or fiber optics. The offshore export cables will transition to onshore export cables in transition vaults or joint bays at the landfall site then continue underground within buried duct bank or vaults um, on shore. Um, HDD will maintain the integrity of the existing coastal infrastructure and protect the, um, the uh, armoring that exists today with bulkhead and riprap. And the cables will be located deep under the shoreline and protected from exposure by erosion. Next slide. This slide shows the Lee River HDD entry point at the preferred landfall. And as you can see on the photos on the right, there is a man-made canal and armored shoreline with riprap and a bulkhead on the western landfall side, providing protection from erosion due to wave action and storm surges. Next slide. The project is cited, planned, and designed to avoid and minimize potential impacts based on robust environmental analysis, including extensive investigations and surveys. Best management practices implemented throughout the project phases will minimize potential impacts, and any adverse impacts that cannot be avoided will be minimized or mitigated. Next slide. And this slide just illustrates the numerous field studies and desktop assessments that have been conducted since 2019 to characterize the onshore and offshore project areas. And uh, this including six seasons of benthic sampling throughout the offshore project area, geophysical, geotechnical surveys from 2019 to 2021. Next slide. Onshore, the onshore project area will not be visible from most of the surrounding landscape. Nighttime lighting of the converter station will be limited to only that required for safety and security, such as at vehicle entry points. Low intensity safety lighting may be affixed to these vehicle entry points and building entry points and will be motion activated and shielded downward. During operations, the converter station will generally be unmanned with personnel on site peri periodically for inspections, maintenance, and repairs. No adverse traffic or air emission impacts are anticipated as a result. The converter station will meet mass DEP requirements to be no more than 10 decibels of greater than quiet ambient noise levels at any inhabited buildings near Brayton Point. And as far as um, electric and magnetic fields, um, Mayflower Wind study predicted EMF from the project. Levels are well below health-based guidelines from the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation for Allowable Public Exposure to Magnetic Fields. This commission is a nonprofit commission formally recognized by the WHO, the World Health Organization. Uh, Mayflower continues to engage stakeholders on this topic through direct outreach and, ded and a dedicated web page for the community, and we invite you to visit it. Uh, next slide. This slide illustrates the EMF informational materials we have on our website, EMF reports, fact sheets, videos. The website also provides the leaving of questions and comments, and please visit it. 
And as you can see here, our website also has a tool for translating information material into several languages for nearby environmental justice populations. And here you can see um, Portuguese uh, is shown on the right. Next slide. The onshore project area would not be visible from most of the surrounding landscape. The project's isolated location on Brayton Point uh, Peninsula physically separates the onshore project area from other land uses and viewpoints. And as you can see from this photo simulation uh, based on topography, vegetation, distance, and development, that the onshore project area features would be practically indiscernible to even highly engaged viewers. And this is a um, photo simulation from Brayton Point Beach in Somerset. And next slide. And this is a photo simulation from South Swansea, Sycamore Street. And again, it just underscores that the onshore project area features would be practically indiscernible to even highly engaged viewers. And next, I will turn this over to our um, uh, community liaison officer, Kelsey Perry, to talk about our uh, proactive community outreach and stakeholder engagement. Kelsey? Great, thanks Kathleen. Um, and thanks everyone for being here and, and being part of this process with us. Um, so Mayfirewind has engaged in outreach to the host community with the goal of informing stakeholders about the project and enabling meaningful engagement throughout this process. We have had consistent and transparent communication with town officials in Somerset, Fall River, and New Bedford, um, and have communicated early about all of our geotechnical and geophysical work going on with Harbor Masters in the area. Um, we have had a series of virtual open house events, um, one of them for the South Coast community on January 27th, which was an overview of our economic development investments. We had another open house specifically for the Somerset and Swansea communities um, on May 4th, which we use our 3D virtual tool for that. Um, it's a simulation of the project from the wind turbines all the way to the infrastructure at Brayton Point. The recordings of these open houses are available on our webpage. Um, ahead of that open house, we did complete door-to-door -door outreach in Somerset in the neighborhood directly adjacent from Brayton Point. And just last month in September, we sent out a mailer to the Swansea residents um, who live across the Lee River adjacent from Brayton Point. Um, as you can see in the left-hand corner on this slide, that's a screenshot of Mayfarwin's virtual exhibition room, which is available on our website. Um, if you go to that link, it links to a poster hall um, with digestible information about our project. We do have all of our permitting documents on our webpage, on our documents webpage, um, but we try to use more tools like the virtual exhibition room, fact sheets, and FAQs, which are all available online. Um, to help stakeholders digest these, you know, lengthy and, um, you know, very intense permitting documents. Next slide, please. We have also been engaging with the fishing industry. We have and will continue to conduct extensive engaging, engagement with both commercial and recreational fisheries. We do have a full-time fisheries liaison officer working on the project who attends regular port hours in both New Bedford, Massachusetts and Port Judith, Point Judith, Rhode Island. Um, we have contracts with fishing captains who conduct scouting trips before our offshore surveys take place to make sure to point out any fishing gear that should be avoided. And we also work very closely with our fisheries representatives. We have three of them, um, including the New Bedford Port Authority and the Massachusetts Lobster Men's Association. Um, again, we do have a lot of resources on our website. We regularly update our Mariners page on our website, and we encourage fishermen and other marine users to check that out and to sign up for our updates to stay in the loop on what's going on offshore. Next slide, please. 
Thank you. This is our last slide. Um, so we also have been actively engaging with the tribe since 2019. Um, we have had early and direct engagement with the tribes as we have considered our best route options and long-term opportunities for the tribes. Um, I do wanna point out one of our workforce development opportunities. We have a partnership with RPS where we put together a protected species observer PSO career training program. This is a cost-free training program for any tribal member who would like to become a PSO. Um, and after you receive the cost-free training, RPS will work to get you offshore working on an offshore wind project. As you can see on the pictures to the bottom of the screen, that's a photo of um, the training that happened in Mayflower Wind's office in Fall River. Um, and that is Josh from the Pacasset tribe out at sea working on Mayflower's geophysical survey work in the lease area. Um, so it's a great opportunity to get involved with offshore wind um, and it has direct employment benefits. And that's it for me. I think I can hand it back to you, Kathleen. Thank you, Kelsey. And, and that concludes our presentation and we are ready to hear comments. Thank you very much. Um, before we begin, I'm going to outline some guidelines to use in speaking at this hearing. There is a stenographer who is also participating remotely and who will transcribe everything said during this hearing. This public comment hearing is also streaming to the Department of Public Utilities YouTube channel. It is only the transcript produced by the stenographer, however, that is the official record of the hearing. As we are all relying on the internet or telephones to participate, we could experience some technical difficulties, such as sound from speakers, including potential background noise, uh, background noise, video and audio issues, and potential delays. Therefore, it is imperative to speak slowly and clearly to allow a speaker to finish speaking before you begin speaking and to pay attention to the video of the person speaking and to my video. I will raise my hand as a signal on my video if I need to interrupt the person currently speaking to ask them to stop. We appreciate everyone's cooperation in, this participate in participating in this hearing. I apologize in advance for any technical difficulties we may encounter through the course of this remote public comment hearing. If you have problems, please raise your hand using, using the Zoom toolbar or dial star nine on your phone if you are participating by phone. You may call or text 857-200-0065 for assistance. In the notice, we requested that anyone with, anyone with an interest in speaking notify the siting board in advance if possible. This is a great help due to the mechanics of the remote platform. We will begin with any federal, state, or local officials who wish to be heard. Then we will proceed with members of the public who have signed up to speak. And finally, we will allow anyone who wishes to speak but who does not have a chance to let us know in advance. Please give us your name and address and spell your name for the stenographer and speak slowly and clearly. Again, please stop speaking if you see me raise my hand in the video. If a company response to a comment question asked is appropriate, I will ask the company representatives if they would like to respond. First of all, are there any public officials who wish to be heard? Please raise your hands using the Zoom feature and one of our staff will take the necessary steps to allow your comments to be heard by everyone and included in the transcript of the hearing. Are there any, are there any uh, public officials who wish to be heard? I'm going to ask the um, the people who control this hearing. Did, did, is there anyone in the waiting room? There is no one who has raised their hand to that. No question. one's raised their hand. Okay. Um, so, not seeing anyone raise their hand as a public official, why don't we start with people, people um, who signed up in the signing board speak, or even um, anyone who wants to speak but didn't get a chance to sign up? Because I think that. No one signed up with the signing board. So if there's any member of the public who would like to speak, please raise your hand using the raise hand button on the Zoom or dial star nine on your phone if you're dialing in. Okay, I see a few hands raised. So I'm gonna move the first 
person who raised their hand. That's Paul Shu. Not seeing him yet. Mr. Shu, uh, could you please turn on your microphone and your camera? Well, Mr. Shu has joined the panel. Mr. Yes. Shu, could How you do? You very good, sir. Could you, I ask you to spell your last name for the stenographer? Sure, it's S-H-E-W. Thank you, Mr. Shu. Please go ahead with your comment. I, I uh, uh, pardon, pardon the delay in getting in touch with you there. Uh, thank you first for the uh, comprehensive presentation. It, uh, it helps give an overview, uh, relatively understandable one to a very, very complex arduous process. And uh, I'm wondering if there is a distilled copy or perhaps this copy might be available. I work with Peer Consultants, which is an environmental engineering firm uh, in full disclosure. So I, I have an interest in understanding it from that yeah. standpoint. I'm sorry, what, what is it that you want a copy of Mr. Shu? The presentation that you've made uh, was very good. If you have a copy of that or a reduced uh, 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 syn synopsis, perhaps of the same, uh, it would be appreciated. Does someone from the company want to respond to Mr. Shu's question? Sure. Uh, we filed a copy of the presentation in the docket today, and Bob, I think, read uh, out okay. the docket number earlier today. So if you have that docket number, then you can just go into the the virtual file room and access the document there. Okay. Mr. Shu, uh, first of yes. all, I, I actually I should have asked you for your address. I didn't, pardon me. Sure, sure. Uh, I live in Franklin, Massachusetts. I'll give you my home address, which is 107 Hillside Road in Franklin, Massachusetts, 02038. Our, okay, uh, our, yeah, our firm is in uh, uh, Burlington, Massachusetts. Peer, Thank you, peer sir. consultants. Yes. Okay. And uh, is it, for the next step, is there anything that you anticipate is going to be of particular note that might affect the people of Somerset in that area? Or is this something that's going to continue on a relatively um, invisible path for a while? And most of it is a paper path or a permitting 60 permits, I think I heard you say, along the way. Fairly impressive. Uh, so is there anything of note that the population might might see or witness? Who would like to respond? Kelsey, are you? Uh, uh, Kelsey, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, so your question is, what will Somerset residents see once, you know, the project gets started? Yes, as the average uh, resident who has sure. an interest but not expertise perhaps in this field. Is there anything yeah. of note? Yeah, uh, I'll just highlight the project's timeline again. Um, so we're still in the permitting development phase, as you mentioned right, right now, it's really all paper. Um, mm -hmm. We still have a couple of years to go to get all of those permits in hand and we're hoping to start onshore construction in 2024. Um, during the onshore construction period, you know, Somerset residents would see some construction activity on Brayton Point. Um, that should only last for a short period of time. We would start on offshore construction in the lease area and for the subsea cables in 2025, which would be further away from Somerset residents and, and not impact them um, in hopes to complete construction in two to three years um, and then be sending clean and green electrons into the grid um, around 2028 or by the end of the decade. 
Um, oh, Mr. Shu, yeah, yeah, to that I would add, um, Kelsey is very modest, but she has, we're very transparent and she's posted on our website copies of all the permit applications that we have filed um, yes. for easy access. Okay, excellent. And as I yeah. take it, even with the build out, uh, this is relatively something that's not particularly notable based on the uh, simulated views that you had. Is that correct? Long yeah, I can um, take that, Kathleen. Yeah. Um, okay. Yes. So, so once the HBDC converter station in, is in operation, right. um, mm -hmm. you, know, you won't be able to hear it. The only thing you'll be able to see, at least from Britain Point Beach, is the very slender lightning rod, um, which is you know hard for the eye to see. So, once right. the construction is over, it, it really there will not be much to see or hear. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you, and th thanks for an excellent presentation. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Mr. Shu, do you have my uh, email address so that you can contact me if you're having trouble accessing any of the documents you've talked about? I'm, I'm sure I can retrieve it. I don't have it with me at the moment, but I'm sure oh. we can we can uh, find it. Uh, okay, EF, good. SB, right, yeah. Thank good. you, Mr. Shea. Thank you, Mr. Shu. Okay, Mr. Green, is anyone else in the, yes. in the waiting room? Yes, we have Patrick McDonald who will be joining us. Mr. McDonald, if you could also turn on your camera and your microphone. Instructions. Sorry, I'm in my vineyard uh, sweatshirt tonight because I'm home. But uh, I, Kelsey, I met, met Kelsey before, and she's been at the town meetings, and I thank her for coming to the town. I think I've seen Kathleen Freeman's presentations. I'm a resident of Brayton Point. I live at 30 Admirals Way in Somerset, Massachusetts, which is a beautiful piece of property. Um, we lived here when the, the uh, coal power plant was here, and we lived here through all the uh, improvements my parents did too, of the cooling towers, of all the environmental restrictions that were put on by Save the Bay Narragansett. I'm a member of Save Our Bay, Brayton Point. Um, that was a zero net admissions facility. And we loved the power plant when it was here because it was regulated to the point where it was not polluting our neighborhood. And I think there's other people that are on this line, including myself, that have survived cancer. Bladder cancer was one of the uh, popular cancers here on Brayton Point. And, uh, and I'm surviving atrial fibrillation, which has been just recently diagnosed. So these are my questions about uh, this project. Is number one, we've heard in prior meetings that the electromagnetic fields that will be created from the Mayflower Wind Project, the 1200, uh, is it kilowatt or megawatt facility? Megawatts. Will be no greater than what was here with the power plant. And my problem is being a resident who's one half mile away from Brayton Point is that we're in 2020, 2022. We're not in 1959. Um, why do I hear an answer that the electromagnetic fields will be no greater than what we're here? Right now is zero. Why should the residents of Brayton Point be, or the Lees River and our good friends on Gardner's Neck, who've joined us in the fight that was here before you guys came in, which I'm sure you're all aware of about the scrap metal operation and trying to make this a commercial industrial port. Why should we be subjected to electromagnetic fields that may harm us? That sounds like a, a question for our engineering manager, Kelly. Um, if uh, Kelly, you wanna take that one? Sure. Um, this is Kelly Smith speaking. I, I've seen you before, Kelly. How are you? Good. How are you? So I, I hear um, what you're saying, Patrick, and we do understand that electric and magnetic fields can be a concern for members of the community. I do want to note that they're produced anywhere that there's a flow of electricity. So when you speak about in the past versus now and, and change in expected EMF levels, it's important to understand that it's 
natural and man-made process and it's tied to the flow of electricity. So for, for Mayflower's cables, we have done extensive modeling of our proposed system. Um, and as Kathleen spoke about earlier, the results of that show that um, there's no, the, the, the predicted levels are well below health-based guidelines set by the International Commission on Non-Ionizing Radiation Protection for allowable public exposure to magnetic fields. And with respect to electric fields, because our cables are underground, those electric fields will be completely shielded by the cable materials. Another thing to note is that magnetic fields dissipate very rapidly with distance from cables. So over in the community, um, you'll be well insulated from those fields, which are located tucked away on private industrial property. You know, so when I take a uh, right-hand turn from O'Neill Road onto Brayton Point Road, that's where your converter station that you propose will be. Um, am I going to be subject to electromagnetic fields? How far up Brayton Point Road am I going to be subjected to electromagnetic magnetic fields as I take the turn from O'Neill Road? And I do walk down to the, the old power plant gate. How much electromagnetic fields am I going to be uh, um, subject to? To the point where it's a cancer risk or no? For a detailed analysis of the modeling that we've done, I'd, I'd point you to our website for the full study, which was completed by experts at this modeling exercise. But again, it dissipates very rapidly with distance from the cables. How rapidly? Am I still going to be within that zone? I mean, I'm a person who walks that every day. I walked it every day when the scrap metal trucks were coming. I've walked it every day before you guys are coming. I walk it every day. So it's just like if you drink one liter of, uh, of something bad every day, it's going to cause a higher risk of cancer. If I walk by your facility every day, am I subject to more cancer risk than somebody who doesn't? Yeah, so, so I, can, I can even elaborate a bit on that, right? So, so the modeling, you know, for example, we've also done the modeling on Portsmouth, Rhode Island, which is very similar cables to what we're looking at on, uh, on, on Brayton Point. And in that case, uh, you know, the same studies showed that we were well below the, uh, the health-based guidelines um, for, you know, somebody who, and this is a typical situation across, you know, many communities in the U.S. where these cables are installed in the roadway, you know, somebody's standing directly over the cables in the roadway. So you'd be, you know, six feet over, over the cables in that case. On Brayton Point, you know, we're looking at distances that are, you know, even even the closest approach uh, from the, the public road is, is, is much further than that. So it's significantly, you know, decreases, as Kelly mentioned, away from it. Um, but even if you were standing right over right over the cable um, in a roadway, um, we would be well below uh, the, the health based guidelines, as, as, as Kelly mentioned. And that's what that analysis that's referenced in the website looks like looks at. So I, I think, you know, that specific location we may not have looked at directly in the analysis, but showed what we would consider to be a more conservative and a more um, you know, stringent case um, and have shown how it decreases as you go further away to, to very, very, very extremely low levels um, that far away. So that's I think I think the direct comment I can say is that we're, you know, we're well below from the, you know, from the guidelines this International Commission has set for health-based uh, you know, long-term exposure to, to EMF. And, and it's even decreased further and further away from, from the cables uh, as, as it trends, yeah. And just one more grounding statement to add to Tim's point that mm -hmm. it is important to remember that there already is existing transmission infrastructure at Brayton Point. And excuse me, Kelly, 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 excuse me. Could you speak a little more slowly? I'm having a hard time understanding you. I, I apologize. Thank you That's for, all right. for catching me. Um, and again, this is Kelly Smith speaking, but I did just want to add one more point to what Tim said which is that there already is existing transmission infrastructure at Brayton Point. And what our project is proposing to build is in kind with what's already there. So that flow of electricity from that existing transmission infrastructure is already producing negligible amounts of electromagnetic fields. You know, I appreciate your comments on that, but that connection has long been tapped off now since 2018. I don't think there's... There's anything coming through there like it was before when it's be, being generated from the plant, and and that's what we don't want to hear, is that 
we're going back to the power plant days because there were many cancers down here. My parents included that lived down here. Um, people died of bladder cancer down here. I think there's a caller on here whose father died from bladder cancer down here. I had bladder cancer down here. We just don't want any more cancers down here. I know that we want green energy. I know I'm in fa favor of green energy versus greenhouse emissions. Um, you got to remember that when Mayflower came in with Vin Vineyard Wynn, you guys didn't even, you guys had Brayton Point on the table and you totally took Brayton Point off the table and went to Falmouth and didn't even address Brayton Point. So I feel like we're like a secondary um, uh, site. Uh, first, you didn't want to be here, but now you do want to be here. And I got some more questions. I'm going to move off from the electromagnetic magnetic fields. Uh, Mr. One, McDonald, just Mr. McDonald, thank you for your questions. I, what I'd say though is this is not a forum for extensive cross-examination. If you'd like to intervene, you can go into as much detail as you'd like, but it's really a forum for so uh, comments. And I do, I do feel, I know what you're saying, Mr. Shea, and we'll probably be responding to that on October 25th, but we're a group of just like, you guys are coming in Mayflower when you're the energy sitting board. We're, we're citizens that are trying to come up to speed and we've been working as hard as we can to come up to speed. So if you just give me a little deference, um, I'm not going to be hugely long, but this is important to our neighborhood. It's important to the people who have been fighting down here for three and a half years for clean air and clean water. We've put up with 50 years of a power plant and polluting and we just want to be in history um, recorded as trying to make sure that the efforts that were not followed back in 1959, you're going to understand that this was a farm for hundreds of years before it was a, a power plant. And now it's been taken down. Now it's looking to be repurposed. And we just have a few more questions. Okay, so, go ahead, sir. So as far as your noise level, we never agreed with the 10 uh, decibels above ambient because that's just impossible to capture by the DEP. So our town came out with a, a uh, noise bylaw, okay? And that was generated by, basically by the residents of Somerset when we had the problems before you guys came in here with the owners of the property. Yes. And the residential... Uh, decibels for a residential area as defined on a property line. And we have property lines that are direct abutters with Brayton Point was from 7 to 10 p.m. The maximum de decibel level that's allowed in a residential area is 65 decibels. Then the maximum allowed decibels from a property line in the residential area from 10 to 7 a.m. are 55 decibels. Is this board looking to try to say that they're exempt from those decibel levels because those decibel levels were very noisy in our neighborhood. Does anyone from the company want to respond? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Shea. And thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, I, again, I'm going to ask um, Kelly Smith, our engineering manager to respond because I know she's been involved with the, um, the noise studies we've been doing. Kelly. Thanks, Kathleen, and apologize if I cut in with a cough here. <laughs> Sorry. Tried to kick it before unmuting. Um, I appreciate the comment. <laughs> Excuse me. We are aware of the local restrictions. More, more. Thank you. I'm going to uh, let Kelsey, um, uh, Kelly, cough for a moment and clear her throat. And uh, I think it's important. Uh, good evening, Mr. McDonald. My name is Lawrence Mock. Uh, I just want to speak for a moment. Uh, I work as a transmission uh, development manager for Mayflower. Um, I want to just quickly uh, go back, if I may, uh, Mr. Shea, on your previous line, and then we can uh, come back to the sound point. Um, I would note, per your question, on the uh, lines, the electric lines going in and out of uh, the end grid and the Brayton Point substation, those remain uh, 
what we'd call online or energized is the technical term. So that energy, uh, uh, as we sit here tonight, is flowing there. Uh, and the wires flow right from the substation actually into the transformers right adjacent the old power building. So that is still uh, active uh, right now. And, and we assume Engrid, because that's a significant interconnection point uh, as part of our electric grid, will uh, remain in that fashion uh, separate from the Mayflower project. Uh, to the sound question, I'll just begin and, and my uh, colleagues can uh, jump in. And Kathleen, you might help me because you can quote specifically the regulation. And I don't think, uh, as stated by Mr. McDonald, that that is the correct uh, term on what we have to meet for Somerset. Yeah, it's um, six. Um, I think the delta is six decibels as opposed to um, uh, the Massachusetts DEP, 10 decibels above quiet ambient levels. No. We, we passed a zoning bylaw that we were having problems with uh, the current owners of the property. So we, we, we deviated from the, uh, from the original noise bylaw and went to a straight so we could measure it decibel level. And we, we got 10 monitors. Did we get 10? No, those were dust. We got like six monitors for noise so we could go out and measure if you're over 65 decibels between this time, you're in violation. If you're over 55 decibels in this time, you're over. We, we bypassed and went to a more stringent standard. Believe me, I've attended every town meeting, every meeting, every zoning board meeting, every conservation meeting, everything involved in Brayton Point because I live here. So um, I just, um, I got the bylaw up on my screen right now. This is a bylaw that was put into effect on May 17th of 2021. And it's a location we're measured. Okay, we're gonna to have to get back to you on that, but thank you, Mr. McDonald. Um, we'll, we'll definitely look into that. Did you, did right, you say so May 2021? May 17th of 2021 was the okay, noise floor bylaw. It. You can get that okay. right off the town, the town website. So okay, very good. my last comment, well, no, it's not my last, it's so all getting close. I don't want to take up everybody's time is vibrations. Will there be any vibrations from this transformer station? Does um, uh, Lawrence, you want to take this one? This is, uh, Lawrence Mott speaking again. Uh, the question about vibration uh, and the answer is uh, during operations, no. Uh, you'll have vibration of the uh, uh, trucks as you bring in uh, during construction for the short construction period. But during uh, operations, uh, it will be the same as what it really is there in the N-grid facility, meaning the N-grid substation and our uh, facility will be uh, similar electrical components that don't uh, uh, vibrate at any frequency that would uh, uh, be felt outside of the fence line of the property because these are uh, high frequency items. So there's no vibration. I have two more comments. Everybody understands that not only Mayflower wind is at Brayton Point, and I know the exact area where you guys wanna go. Um, uh, there's also gonna be Prismium cable that wants to develop 47 or 50 acres of Brayton Point, and they want 670, 627 vehicle trips per day. And Kava Industries, who has, I think, still has some type of agreement with Brayton Point, is still advertising this as a commercial industrial port with 147 acres of industrial laydown areas. The environmental impacts of all of those combined, I think are an overload on the Brayton Point property. There was one business down here that was a power plant. It took up the entire area. It produced, I think, 1600 megawatts of power or 1400. There's somebody who probably will answer before me of power. It had about Fifth tops 
35 to 50 people. And now we're talking about Mayflower Wynn, its operation, Prismium Wire Group, its operation. And I think that security plan, I don't think there should be, I think that Prismium should be, uh, Mayflower should be, have some type of security plan given what's going on down there because you are now, we see how important energy is worldwide and what's happening with countries conflicting over energy. What type of security plan and how far do you want businesses away from your convertive station? I'd say there's gotta be a large buffer zone with security because we're concerned with what's gonna happen down here if this becomes a target. Would someone from the company like to respond? Sure. Um, well, thank you for that, Mr. McDonald. Um, as as um, I mentioned earlier, we're gonna have per safety perimeter fencing around the converter station and restricted access, but we will, you know, obviously we, to protect our assets and to protect the converter station, uh, we will have uh, protective measures in place. And, and, and as I mentioned earlier, that we plan to coordinate uh, with the landowner and the other tenants uh, to ensure minimizing uh, any cumulative impacts from, and our operation is going to be an unmanned substation. So no, once we've built the converter station, there will be uh, minimal or negligible impacts at all continuing going forward. But thank you for that comment. I think that might be a concern of the residents. My last one is what is Mayflower Wind going to contribute to the infrastructure of Somerset? My I'm life. going I'm to. Life. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. Really great comment. I'm going to ask Kelsey to respond to that. Sure. Um, Kelsey Perry. So just to pin on infrastructure specifically, all we'll have in Somerset is the HVDC converter station. Um, but I think the question of benefits is an important one. So, of course, as we mentioned with offshore wind projects like this, there's lots of supply chain opportunities, employment opportunities, um, climate and environmental opportunities. But for the town of Somerset, Specifically, um, we are a long-term business partner and we will be engaging in our responsibilities regarding tax liabilities for having the infrastructure on Brayton Point. So we're committed to working with the town to construct some type of fair compensation agreement um, once we get there. So why do I read in other articles that Barnstable is going to get $16 million in industrial taxes? And then I hear that the town of Portsmouth, who's not hosting the end connection, is going to get $28 million. Why hasn't Somerset been offered something like that? Because you don't own the prop. I know it's landing on a private um, piece of property, but to get there, you're coming through waters that are owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and are within the jurisdiction of some, the town of Somerset. Why isn't the town of Somerset being uh, allowed some type of monetary stipend to host Mayflower Wind here. Yeah, um, so I, I just wanna clarify that Mayflower has not come to an agreement with Falmouth or Portsmouth regarding an agreement or a monetary value quite yet. Um, other developers have, but not Mayflower. Um, but we have been engaging in those types of conversations. And just to reiterate, we are committed to speaking with town officials on this topic and to coming to an agreement for a fair compensation agreement. So I don't have, you know, the exact value or what that will look like today, um, but I can, I can assure you that that conversation will progress as the project does. So should the town of Somerset um, intervene to have those negotiations go forward? Because I see that I see that Portsmouth, Middletown, and Little Compton just entered into a cooperation agreement, um, and and they're looking at it, and they want to make sure that they're compensated. And I, so, yeah, and I know Miss Freeman. That's a town decision, and I'm very involved in this town, 
And um, I'm speaking as a resident, but I'm making sure that our town gets the same benefits that every other town gets. Your, the end run is right here. And you also, this is my last comment, is I've heard that the second set of lines that you want to have empty, I'm going to land at Brayton Point, but then the, the plan proposal is to, is to drill those underneath the town of Somerset and go to Montauk because ISO New England wants two separate 1,200 uh, megawatt facilities. So I think that the town of Somerset, you're asking us to say, hey, approve 1,200 megawatts. We're going to be blank on 1,200, and then we're going to come back and impose more um, uh, impacts on the town of Somerset environmentally um, to the town of Somerset. And I think that our town, and I'm going to speak to our leaders, uh, made sure that this town has the same compensation and the same considerations that everybody else is asking for a project this size. Thank you, Mr. McDonald. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shea, for, for letting me speak so long. Uh, our pleasure. Thank you for your comments. Um, now, is there, Mr. Green, is there anyone else who wants to uh, make comments? And Mr. Green, you're, you're muted. All right, uh, Duncan Peterson. Mr. Peterson. Mr. Peterson yep. will ask you to spell your last name and give us your address. Sure, yeah, last name's P-E-D as in dog, E-R-S-E-N. Um, okay. I'm from uh, 21 Bradford Street in uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Very good, Mr. Peterson. Thank you. And please give, talk, say what, um, please feel free to give your comment now. Great. Yeah. So, um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, first time, long time. Uh, if I say anything silly, um, please feel free to uh, kick me off or, or just uh, direct me to the resources that could answer my question. But um, so I'm a, I'm a new Boston um, resident and um, I've become for the last couple of years uh, a, a, an alternative energy advocate. Um, I definitely support um the energy transition I, I think it's obviously a massively um technologically complex issue a politically complex issue multifaceted and, and i'm happy that um companies like you and individuals like you are um participating um so my, my two questions though i i um are, are around financials um and, and reliability and and again maybe you can just point me to to a link that will answer these questions but um in terms of reliability you mentioned the uh the fact that these green electrons are coming onto the grid. Um, obviously there's intermittency issues um, and, and we need dispatchable power, as I understand it, to um, to sort of be on standby, whether that's a combined cycle gas plant that's got the turbines going half speed um, and is ready to uh, to turn on when the wind stops blowing. So, so my first question, um, and, and I'll add the two questions together, they should be quick and maybe you can knock them out in one. So I, my first question would be um, what, dirty electrons are we displacing um, with these new offshore wind electrons? Um, and, and when the wind stops blowing, what, what's our replacement, um, our replacement power plan look like? Um, I, I know it's, it's ISO New England that needs to handle that reliability to an extent, but I, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Um, and, and the second question would be, um, who's, who's paying for this? Um, you know, I, I understand there's you know, state financing and federal financing and, and whatnot. And, and, you know, obviously changes by the, by the six months. Um, but um, I, I, of course there's gotta be, and I understand that the, maybe the wind turbines are not necessarily the subject of this project, but um, you know, there's overbuilding requirements. There's, um, you know, additional transmission requirements as we, uh, we need to pull in that power, that replacement power from another power plant, um, maybe that gas plant that's replacing these wind electrons is located a state away and we need to build out um, some, some transmission lines to get that backup power to us. Um, so there's obviously additional system costs. Um, and, and I know that uh, one of the, the mandates or, or points that we discussed at the beginning of this meeting was that this is going to um, be good for the right pair. Um, so, so I would just ask where has who's done the the study that um that that'll tell me how much this is going to cost um and, and i don't mean any of those questions to you know sound flippant or anything like that i'm just curious about reliability mm -hmm. and financials and i'd love to get someone's thoughts thanks thank well, you thank you oh sorry go ahead, go ahead. Ms. Ms. freeman please please answer please thank you mr peterson i am going to um uh punt this one to our council who 
who's carefully helped us with our petition uh, and reviewed um, the PPAs and and um, the uh, retirement of fossil fuel burning facilities and and why this benefits um, ratepayers in the winter time. Mm -hmm. um, do you, uh, for reliability, you want to take a crack at it? Yeah, happy to. Okay. So you have a lot going on there, uh, Duncan. But um, the first question is, you know, what is it replacing? Obviously, you have a fleet of generation throughout New England, some of which is older, some of which is, uh, you know, coal fired or oil fired. Uh, coal fired is already retired. Oil fired is still there somewhat, but it will retire. They also have nukes that have retired recently. And so all of those um, need to get replaced. And so large facilities like this offshore wind generation will replace those. You're correct that you will need dispatchable generation of some sort, um, certainly farther into the future. And that will potentially be new gas fire generation or something else that we don't even know about in terms of the technology of that generation. Um, and that will still be around. But what you do need is something that uh, will have a high capacity factor, especially in the winter months that can provide energy security. And offshore wind is uh, known for that. Uh, offshore wind has a very high capacity factor relative to other inter intermittent resources. So uh, it's available when perhaps some others are not, especially when it might be needed as we become a winter peaking system, especially later into the future. So that's um, the answer to the first part of your question. The second part had to do with financing. And um, right now, these projects are you know, largely financed through long term power purchase agreements that these are entered into with the electric distribution companies. I mentioned earlier in our presentation the need for the project, and I I particularly pointed to legislation that is out there, and part of that legislation is uh, legislation that requires procurements of large amounts of offshore wind energy. And so those contracts are uh, being formed pursuant to that legislation. And those contracts themselves then get reviewed by the Department of Public Utilities for various uh, factors and standards that they have to meet, including um, benefits to ratepayers. And so there is a cost analysis that is done uh, and the approval comes only after that analysis is done. Can I just add, um, yeah. yeah, the $2 billion in savings came from the Department of Energy Resources. They had run the, um, the model. And I, I believe um, that um, Lawrence uh, from our team would like to add to this, Lawrence. And uh, these are excellent questions. These are not silly. Um, uh, take your pencil there, Brattle Group, B-R-A-T-T-L-E, Brattle Group. They did a, a several studies uh, that look at savings to the ratepayers and uh, how in the long term of two of the points you brought up, which is the renewable generation and the transmission upgrades are uh, beneficial to the ratepayers. So do uh, take a look at those. Uh, next one to further what uh, Mr. Runge uh, focused on, which is a few numbers for you to think about that maybe help round this out. A uh, typical solar panels in a residential application may be 15 to 20% capacity factor. And capacity factor, when we use that term, is 100% capacity factor would be running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And so as I referenced, solar may be 15 or 20, a large solar array may be uh, 20 to 22 in a Massachusetts type setting. When you go up to land uh, onshore wind, let's say 35, you go to offshore wind at 55, you look at natural gas around uh, 65 to 75, depending on the type of plant, uh, nuclear is somewhere similar in that 75, 80 region with the refueling process. Uh, so that those are some of the real comparison numbers. The uh, next one is uh, the efforts on a grid operation allow for the ability to bring the lowest cost resource in. And so you're not requiring a, a plant, as you mentioned, to be sitting at idle. Uh, that's quite rare now. Uh, with the mix of generation we have so that you're not uh, burning fuel needlessly uh, in case a wind plant comes off. 
And I'd also uh, mention that wind, especially compared to solar, has a very predictable on and off ramp. So the operators can predict when it's coming. So this really is a future for what I call a very practical generation. Uh, I'd also note you use the word alternative. I'd like to say this is mainstream uh, and uh, it is renewable energy. Thank you. Thank you all. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. If there are any others who would like to comment, please raise your hand. Uh, Holly McNamara. Ms. McNamara, we'll ask you to spell your last name and to give us your address. Hi, M-C-N-A-M-A-R-A. -A -A. And, and your address? I live in Somerset. I prefer not to give my address due to an assault case that was just tied up in court. Oh, okay. Um, so I'm actually a former selectman in Somerset. I resigned a little over a year ago. And I just want to be sure that, especially Mayflower, is I've, you know, I've met Kelsey. I've had great conversations with, with her. And I just want you to know that the silent majority in town supports Mayflower and really is, is grateful that you have chosen us and you're investing here. Um, and the fact that we can be at the forefront of something so progressive um, for the entire country is just, it's, it's unbelievable. So um, thank you. And thank you for everyone's hard work. Um, if anyone has, you know, I'm still available even though I'm not a selectman anymore, but I'm happy to help if anyone needs some, some help kind of navigating the waters here, it can be pretty difficult. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to let everybody know that, you know, I'm sure you have the same um, handful of people, the, a lot of NIMBYs that come to your meetings and the silent majority does not attend. I, I apologize, I've not been able to go to any of these hearings or meetings or forums, um, but I did wanna come on today and at least reassure you that the majority in, in the town really supports and trusts you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. McNamara, for your <laughs> comment, kind remarks. Yeah, nice <laughs> to see you, Holly. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you. And Kelsey has my info if anyone needs it. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Again, if there's anyone who would like to comment, please raise your hand. Mr. Shea, I think we have uh, heard all of those who wish to speak. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Before we conclude the public comment hearing this evening, I would like to remind everyone of the opportunity to participate in the Siting Board's review of the project if you so desire. We would encourage anyone who does seek to participate to review the information on different types of participation that is listed in the public comment hearing notice for this proceeding and on the Siting Board website. If you would like a copy of the notice and intervention rules, please send your contact information to my email at Robert dot j dot shea s h e a at mass dot gov and i can send the information to you by email any written comments that you may wish to file or any petitions to participate further in the evidentiary hearings should also be sent to me at my email address of robert dot j dot shea s h e a at mass dot gov Comments are due by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022, and petitions to participate as an intervener or a limited participant are also due by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, October 25th, 2022. In addition, any petitions or comments must also be sent by email or email attachment to the Council for Mayflower Wind, Eric K. Runge, Esquire, of the firm Day Pitney LLP. Mr. Runge's email address is ekrunge, R-U-N-G-E, at daypitney, D-A-Y-P-I-T-N-E-Y, dot com. 
That's E K R U N G E at D A Y P I T N E Y dot com. If you want a clarification of anything that I've said during this hearing, please email me at robert.j.shea, S H E A, at mass.gov. Um, if you want to write, please write before Tuesday, October 25th, 2022, which is the deadline for receipt of public comment in this document. In this docket. Thank you all for your participation in this hearing tonight. Now I'd like to go off the record. Um, does anyone have any matters that they wish to address before we um, close for the evening? No. No. Okay. Thank you. Hearing none, then thank you all for being here. It was a pleasure, and um, we will continue to see you as this case goes on. Uh, I have given you my email address many times, so you may contact me at, at any time if you have any questions. Thank you, and good night. Thank all right, you. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.